like any any terminology that you did not hear me mention that you heard your instructors mention then I'll open it up for questions like that because if I start using certain terms that maybe they haven't used then I lost you right so okay so my name is Raul Lagodon I'm the program director been program director for the last four years here in the college and um, we are a partnership with Santa Monica College and before that, I was working uh, also in the program, but not as director. Um, so in total, I've been here for 12 years with the program. And then aside from that, or during that same time frame, um, I've been a respiratory therapist for 19 years with Kaiser Permanente, uh, currently just per diem status. So you know what per diem is, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go over invasive and non-invasive uh, ways to ventilate a patient. Okay, so ventilator type. So the ones you're going to be seeing here are the latest ventilators that are out. Um, and I, I, I put the ones that are Kaisers because there's probably more Kaisers than there is other hospitals. You know, so these are, uh, but these are the same ones that you'll see at County, uh, Presbyterian, all the other hospitals that you guys rotate through. <coughs> so invasive versus non invasive ventilation. So just a little bit of a background. This is LA County, uh, I believe back in the fifth, early 50s. Um, this is when there was a polio epidemic. These are the ventilators, the, the, the ventilators or invasive ventilators back then. Okay, so this is where you had a patient. Um, they, they were fully surrounded by these giant, huge steel, um, they call them iron lungs. They weighed about 800 pounds each. You can see there's a lot of nurses, a lot of patients, and it was just, it's like a giant warehouse of, of, to ventilate patients, right? Because they're eight feet long, 800 pounds, just a, a lot of work. In fact, look at the, the buddy system that the nurses used to use, right? Usually it's, now it's just two buddy systems and to rotate your patient every two hours. Uh, not then, back then you needed look at six different nurses just because of the weight of these devices. So these were all to help a, pers a person breathe. So the way this function was, if this was the iron lung here, it was surrounding the patient's body and it was creating negative pressure, very much like a vacuum cleaner would. And it would intermittently create a vacuum over the chest and making the chest, chest rise, opening up the space inside of the lung cavity and now creating a pressure gradient for air to flow in and out of the lungs. Okay, so this, this is what took place. Uh, there still is, there, from what I heard, there's like a handful in LA County. There's still patients that are on these iron lungs. Now, it, the way you'll see iron lungs is just um, what they call it, it's just like a little chest shell, a turtle shell. And then that va same vacuum effect, same concept takes place here with some of the smaller pediatric kids. And then there was this time frame when we knew that it was carbon dioxide that was the stimulus to make a person breathe. So you know, CO2, they figured if we can put CO2, dry ice, inside or next to a patient, then that CO2 would stimulate the patient to breathe. And that concept was tried on, on uh, neonates that weren't breathing, maybe they were premature, and so they needed to breathe more. Uh, that, that was found to not work. But you, you see how they were trying different things instead of just sticking a tube down into a patient's lungs, right? Or use these giant 800 pound machines. This looks like an iron lung, but it has a different effect. So also, this is 1950, they used the opposite of negative pressure with these babies. You can see the baby, is, this is a premature baby. It has some retractions. So they tried to do, they tried to simulate the baby being placed back in utero, and this positive pressure around the baby's chest was mimicking intrauterine contraction. So the thought was that it could condition the baby's lungs to start breathing more effectively, you know, now that they were born. At the same time, they were giving them oxygen. You see, this is a flow meter, so they were dialing in oxygen, and the baby was gaining like 60% oxygen. So three times the amount of normal, right? 21% is normal. So they were getting these contractions every so often, positive pressure, and then giving them the 100% oxygen. This also failed because of the amount of oxygen, right? And just the science behind it, the thought was good, but it just didn't work. 
Then we came from these giant 800 pound iron lungs and they changed it to these tiny eight pound ventilators. So they call them respirators back then, okay? So eight, eight pound respirators made out of plastic and metal. And this gentleman is the one that made it. This was his invention. He has this extra strawberry shortcake tin cans. And there was uh, rubber plates there, magnets, mm -hmm. and then you have a pressure manometer, just like the one over here. And then over here, a person would place their mouth on it and breathe in and out and separate the magnet and the metal plates. So whatever attraction was taking place there. Mm -hmm. And so he did this for his wife. He was a physician in the Air Force, and uh, he did it for his wife who had emphysema. And um, from that, they, this was invented. So this is his ventilator, okay? And this was done worldwide. So worldwide, there was iron lungs, and then from little by little, but very soon after, they just went from these 800 pounds to eight pounds. Okay, so it went negative ventilation to now positive ventilation. Positive because it was no longer creating a negative flow into the lungs, it was now pushing the air into the lungs. So it, was now, it wasn't passive, now it was active ventilation. All right, so just a little bit of background here. This is a pulmonary system. Uh, this is stuff you guys already know through anatomy and physio, but just because I want to point out some stuff on the next slide. So you have blood flow that's deoxygenated, comes through the right ventricle, pulmonary system, uh, oxygenates it, left ventricle, cardiac output, systemic system, goes out, uh, to the tissues and then waste come back through venous return back to the right side oxygenate all over again so when we now went from negative pressure ventilation to positive pressure ventilation we had to make sure that we understood that positive pressure increases lung and intrapleural or intrathoracic just the space inside the lungs pressures and this positive pressure is transmitted to the intrathoracic vessels so as we put positive pressure inside these lungs, this pressure pushed out against all the vasculature that's, that the heart is using, right? And since we're talking about you know, the, lung, the, the, the lungs having to oxygenate the blood and come back around, we had to put those two together. Positive pressure is affecting venous return. And so we see here that systemic hypotension, it rarely occurs if we were to be on the ventilator, but if we have patients who are unhealthy, which is everybody in the hospital, usually, right? Your COPD and your CHF patient. But when we put them on the ventilators and we provide positive pressure ventilation, they are going to get more tachycardic and that's gonna be as a result of decreased stroke volume because of that decreased venous return back to the, the right side of the heart, right? So what happens is we push air into the lungs and that cause a thinning of the pulmonary capillary, right? The blood flow or in the pulmonary vasculature. And then that's because of the over distension of the alveoli. So when we provide this ventilation, even though it looks very simple, we have to be very precise in how much we give. Just like you have to look at how many micrograms per weight you have to give your patient, otherwise you'll overdose them, right? or they'll have other systemic side effects, we will too. If we don't give them an ideal tidal volume, precise per, per ideal body weight, we will cause these problems, and then you're gonna have to deal with it as a nurse, right? Because now you're chasing the blood pressure mm -hmm. and uh, heart rate, et cetera. So the benefits of providing positive pressure ventilation is gonna be improved cardiac function. So how could that be if I just told you that there's a thinning of the capillary walls and this extra thoracic pressure and it decreases venous return? It shouldn't. If I do things right on my end, then I will improve cardiac function because I will provide oxygen to the tissues. The person will not be starving for more oxygen. They're not gonna be breathing as fast. Their heart rate's not gonna go as high, right? So it will, it should improve cardiac function. Okay. If when a person takes a deep breath, like if they're having a hard time breathing and they are, what are the type of, the two most common patients you'll see in the hospital? For what? In the hospital, just, just in general, the hospital patients that get admitted, the majority are, what type of patients? Stroke. 
Like, are you looking for a diagnosis uh -huh. or, yes. or a common diagnosis? Oh. Yeah, a very common diagnosis in the hospital. We deal with COPD. Heart failure. Heart failure, stroke. stroke. Heart, 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 heart Cardiac heart issues, right? So when these patients have their lungs, basically they're, uh, they're congested, right? They have to create large, gener large uh, pleural pressures to take the air in, to push out against all this pulmonary, all this congestion that they have. So if we can alleviate that by putting pressure into the lungs, oxygenating the blood, then they're gonna improve cardiac function. Right? They're not gonna be, because all, all that pressure is pushing up against the cardiac, against the heart. So if we alleviate all that pulling because they're in so distress, in so much distress, then we can improve the cardiac function, improve the myocardial oxygenation that we give, decrease the preload to the heart, improve stroke volume, decrease afterload to the left heart. Okay, so if, if we're not careful, we could do harm, if, but ideally, awesome. we are doing all of this, okay? Even, so it's not just COPD patients, it's not just asthmatics, it's the cardiac patients as well. All right, so we have these two ventilator types that we can help these patients with. We could either do it invasively by putting an ET tube or a patient that might have a tracheostomy tube, or we can do it non-invasively with a full face mask covering the nose and the mouth, or just the nose. There are uh, three ways that I'm gonna tell you we ventilate a patient. There's a bunch of modes, they're very specific, but I'm gonna tell you the three most common. So you have assist control, SIMV, which stands for synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. So let's just, and then the last one is spontaneous. So if we take out the keywords, I'll use control here, intermittent right here, and spontaneous. So if I want to have full control of the patient because they are very sick and I want to control them on the ventilator, I'm going to put them on AC. If a person is getting better and, uh, and I don't have to control them fully, then I'm gonna help them intermittently. That's SIMV. And then the patient that's, he's doing so good, we've fixed his underlying problem, he's now getting ready to get extubated and breathe out of his own, that's gonna be spontaneous. Okay, patient is breathing spontaneously. So every one of those, we can deliver a certain tidal volume Okay, that is the size of the, the amount of uh, volume that's going into the patient's lungs on every breath. Okay, and this is where we do talk about uh, precision, so ideal body weight. So we look at their height, male, female, and their um, height, male, female. This is weight. Height, male, female. Weight. No, you need that, weight. I am trying to get the ideal body weight. Height, male, female, and age. Yes, I believe that's it. Wow, I can't believe I forgot that right there. Anyways, okay, let's go on to the next thing. The flow rate, how fast do I want to deliver this tidal volume? If a person is in distress, they want the help right away, I'm gonna give them a faster flow rate. Frequency is how many times a minute will I deliver this tidal volume? PEEP and FiO2 was the pressure or the positive end expiratory pressure. So that's the pressure that's left inside of the patient's lungs at all times during, during uh, while they're on the ventilator. And then FiO2, fraction of inspired oxygen. So here you have your rate with the F indicated by the F. There's your tidal volume, okay? Um, this inspiratory time, that kind of, it correlates with the flow rate, okay? And then you have your FiO2 and you have your P. Okay, so the way all these ventilators, whether it's invasive or non-invasive, it's gonna be separated in three categories. It's how do I wanna ventilate the patient? Okay, what is the patient actually doing up on top? And then I get an inside look of what's taking place in the lungs. So this is not just for cool graphics. This is, we actually look at this and we analyze it and we fine tune the patient's ventilation and we can touch it and turn it and adjust it based on what we see as an inside look of how we're ventilating the lungs. So for example, here I put a rate, a assist control rate of 10, and the patient is doing a rate of 10. 
does, the patient is getting controlled breath.